Good evening, Chair. Calls to order public hearing for Resolution 022-23, 911 fee increase, telephone bills. Uh, Council this evening, uh, we're pleased to have Deputy Director, or excuse me, Director Ayers, Rick Ayers, and Deputy Director Woods and Brennicky here with us this evening. And Ross, good to see you as well, sir, um, whenever you're ready. County Treasurer Robbie Salas. So uh, on behalf of the county executive, bringing forth a proposal to increase the 911 fee from 75 cents to $1.50 uh, per month, and the proceeds of which are used to partially offset our 911 um, expenses that the county has. So I'm just going to run through um, a couple of quick slides here before I turn it over um, to Director Ayers. Uh, Mer the Maryland Public Safety Code uh, 131 gives counties the right to have a 911 fee. You can see, in addition to the state 911 fee, uh, the governing body of each county may, by ordinance or resolution, enact a uh, 911 fee after a public hearing, which is, of course, what we're here for this evening. Um, and then the amount of that county 911 fees may not exceed a level necessary to cover the total eligible expenses of, uh, of the 911 system in the county. So we cannot set a fee that would be higher uh, than those eligible expenses. And that is audited. The audits are uh, turned into the state. It's actually done by an external auditor, the same external auditor does the county's um, uh, uh, comprehensive financial audit. So just kind of provide a little bit of a history here of the 911 so, uh, fee. So back in 1979, the state of Maryland enacted a 10 cent fee for all telephone subscribers and then uh, took that revenue from those dimes and split it among all 24 um, uh, counties in Baltimore City. Um, that lasted to about 1983 when the state of Maryland then allowed the counties to enact their own uh, specific 911 fee up to a total of 35 cents. Hartford County the following year adopted at the 25 cent rate. Um, then about seven years later, the um, state of Maryland allowed counties to increase that uh, local fee to uh, 50 cents and Hartford County followed suit uh, by adopting a 50 cent rate in 1990. In 1995, uh, the state of Maryland expanded the state and the local fee uh, to cover wireless phone bills in addition to uh, landlines. Then in uh, 2003, the state of Maryland increased the statewide fee to 25 cents and the local uh, fee cap to 75 cents. And then the following year, Harper County adopted at that 75 cent rate. Uh, then in 2018, uh, the state of Maryland established the commission to advance the next generation 911 across Maryland. This was more or less a comprehensive work group that was going to look at all aspects of the 911 system, uh, not just the 911 fees, but also the technology behind 911. Um, you know, the ability to text for 911, um, whole issues revolving around recruitment and retention of uh, dispatchers. Uh, I know here on the county that uh, Randy, Randy Cunningham was one of the commissioners of that. I know Ross Coates was also very active in it as well. Um, and I found myself as uh, a, a late addition to that committee in uh, 2020. Then in uh, 2019, the state of Maryland kind of out of that um, 911 commission uh, increased the statewide fee to 50 cents and they raised the local cap to $1.50. And one of the big changes they made here is that they said henceforth the fee would apply to all phone numbers, uh, not just bills. So before it was applied to just an individual bill. And so let's say if you had a, a family, uh, a family bill, you had two people on the same, same account or three people, you still only had that 175 cents from the county. Um, henceforth, after 2019, that then applied to, uh, to all, all individual phone numbers. Um, then in 2022, uh, also coming from that 911 commission, uh, the state of Maryland uh, increased the local cap to a level to, sufficient to cover all 911 expenditures. So there was no longer a hard cap and allowed counties um, to set their 911 fee at a rate that, that fully captured uh, all of their eligible expenses. Oh, I forgot to push the slide the last time. Sorry about that. All right. So this next slide just shows kind of a history of our 911 revenues and expenditures. These are audited. Um, and you can see uh, back in 2013, we were bringing in around 1.6 million, but we were even then spending about 6 million, running a deficit of about 4 million. And we've continued to run that deficit kind of through each and every year. You will see in around uh, 20, uh, 2020 that we did see an increase in our revenues. That was the effect of those of the bills uh, of the 911 fee being applied to individual phone lines as opposed to the bills. Yeah, I will say that originally the expectation across the state was that we were going to receive a lot, uh, a lot more funding from that, um, and that was, was, um, was very much kind of under, underestimated. We did see an increase, you see going from about 1.8 million to about 2.5, 2.6, 2.8 million, uh, but again, nowhere near 
uh, the level of, of um, uh, to a level sufficient to cover our expenditures. So now kind of looking into uh, fiscal year 23, the current year we're in, and also some preliminary looks at, at the fiscal year 24 budget. So in fiscal year 23, we budgeted $2.7 million in revenue. Our budgeted expenditures were 9.3, um, so even then still maintaining that deficit of 6.6 .6 million. So in fiscal year 24, if we do not change the revenue as proposed, and if, if it just stays at that $3 million, I round it there, um, we already know that our projected expenditures are going to be close to $11 million. And this will be some of the things that Director Ayers goes over with momentarily. Um, because there's been many changes we've had to make, uh, both to provide um, the adequate level of 911 surface, service um, that our citizens um, um, are entitled to, but then also really to keep in, in line with a lot of these ongoing state mandates um, and re requirements from them. Um, and so then in fiscal year 24, if we do uh, increase the rate to $1.50, our projected revenue would go to $6 million. Um, our projected expenditures would still stay the same. Um, and it would reduce the size of that, of, that overall, of that overall deficit. And with that, I will turn it over to Director Ayers to kind of talk about some of the expenditures that we've already put in place in fiscal year 23 and will be carrying on to fiscal year 24. OK, thank you, Robbie. Council President, council members, thanks for letting me come and speak with you tonight. Um, it's, it's ironic that we're introducing this tonight because this is actually the telecommunicator week, and I think we're um, going to talk to you a little bit more later tonight about that as well. But um, just wanted to start off the conversation that I think our people that work in the 911 Center are the unsung heroes of public safety, really. Um, they're, nothing really starts until they answer the call and send help. So um, in 2018, uh, we did a staffing study of our 911 center, and, and that su study showed that we were um, very understaffed, um, and there, was, there really was an immediate need for additional full-time uh, personnel to work in the 911 center. Since that time, we've seen the population grow. We've seen state mandates come down uh, on things that had to happen in the 911 center. Technology, as you probably can imagine, in a 911 center changes drastically, and all the people that work there have to stay up on the new technology. Um, so some of the things that I'll talk about tonight is why we need this additional funding. Um, the county executive was um, very supportive to put in uh, 17 new public safety dispatchers in the FY24 budget. and we need that for several reasons, but one of the biggest things is there's a state mandate that says we have to answer all 911 calls within 10 seconds. We had 5,000 people that called 911 in Hartford County last year where they didn't get answered until it passed that 10 second mark. And as the director of the department, um, that doesn't make me feel real good to know that 10, or 5,000 or more people um, didn't get answered until well past that 10 second mark. So we definitely need additional staffing to try to meet that state law and national standard. Um, we also have a lot of technology enhancements that we need to use this money for. Um, Cybersecurity is a huge thing that we need to work on and uh, the old uh, Simple telephone lines have been replaced by a data network. Um, all of these changes require additional funding. Um, I would like to say that our pay for our people in the 911 center is where it needs to be, but we're, we're, we're not where we need to be in the market. Um, we're looking at trying to do an adjustment for the people that work in the 911 center. Um, we have to stay competitive, just like we do with EMS, um, because everybody is stealing everybody's employees. If they offer two or three thousand dollars more than a neighbor jurisdiction, then we lose our people to those jurisdictions. Um, all the people that work in the 911 center have to be trained on national standards. So, before they're released to work alone in the in the and answer 911 calls, they have to be trained on 
emergency medical dispatch, emergency police dispatch, and emergency fire dispatch. Um, and they have to maintain those certifications to continue to work there. Um, it's not like it was when I got hired in 1984 where you got training for about one day and then you were told you're on your own. <laughs> now they have to go through a five-week academy before they even make it into the 911 center. Um, we also uh, are currently meeting with the three municipalities. Um, one of the recent laws that was changed in Annapolis um, said that we can't transfer 911 calls anymore. So right now, if you call 911 in Bel Air or Aberdeen or Haber de Grace, when we answer the 911 call, we say, hold on in the middle of the call and transfer that caller to that town. That's not really good business, and we want to change that. The law says we need to change that. So we're meeting now with the three municipalities to put a planning team together uh, with the county executive support to um, see how long it would take for us to plan to get the uh, the towns enrolled in our center at hickory so that's something that we also need this additional funding for um and with that i think i'll be open to any questions that any of you might have <coughs> well uh director ayers mr sandless i want to thank you for your presentation and um mr ayers 84 1984 1984 and things have changed dramatically since then. You mentioned 5,000 calls coming into the EOC that uh, took you a little longer to answer than possible. Over, how many, ten, over 10 seconds. How many calls total do you get annually? So last year we had on the business lines, uh, which we also get emergency calls on the business lines. I mean, a lot of people in the county still call the 6600 number to get the sheriff's office instead of calling 911. So on the business lines, we took 120,893 last year, and on the 911 lines, we took 97,022 calls, 911 calls. Mm -hmm. So between the two, about 200,000 calls came into the center. And uh, when you talk about the, t the dispatchers, they are definitely our first responders. There's no question about that. I think they're the unsung heroes that they people are. don't recognize. And I'm very proud of my youngest daughter, who's been there almost 20 years now. Yes, so uh, she does an outstanding job and really appreciate the fact that she's there and cares as much as she does. Yes, uh, with that, Council. Mr. Pemmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Ayers, Mr. Sandless, thank you for your presentation. And I would concur um, the dispatchers are the first line of defense and, and heroes. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, I do have uh, some questions. I long advocated for public safety, uh, but just questions about um, it being centered on a fee or a tax increase. And I think the county executive also had the same concern supporting this legislation in 2019 under uh, Senate Bill 339 in the Maryland General, General Assembly when he voted no for it. So it's it just, just a few questions just to kind of clear up. Um, on the bill, and on page two, line seven, the bill implies that the county may impose a fee sufficient to cover maintenance and operation costs of 911. My thoughts is that could be a broad statement. Uh, the 911 system includes the, uh, the uh, equipment, the dispatchers, the call center, as you mentioned, but also the deputies knocking on the door for that emergency. Would any of that money qualify to the actual first responders on the ground, not necessarily in the dispatch center? So all of the eligible expenses um, are set by, by the state. This is before they were required to do an audit with the state. So I don't believe that the, um, uh, like the next step, the, the, the deputies responding would be. So it would be the, it's largely the salaries of the, of the dispatchers and the, um, the, the supplies and materials and technology that, that they have um, available. So it wouldn't um, include those, those other additional um, cost and as we've shown in those slides before, you know, even with the new enhanced revenue, it would still fall uh, short of what our, our total expenditures are just for those isolated eligible expenditures. Okay. Um, in the code, Maryland Public Safety Code one three eleven under section C, paragraph two, it reads. I'm just going to read it. Uh, if the revenues uh, attributable to the county 911 fee for a fiscal year do not provide the revenues necessary to cover a county's operational cost for 911 uh, system for that fiscal year, the county may, for the following fiscal year, impose a county 911 fee sufficient to cover the county's projected operation costs for the 911. 
And I think that wording is, is kind of unique, um, and, and your, the bill alludes to that as well. So my question is, though, is that fee indefinite, or uh, at least would it come back for a second resolution um, for an update for the necessary revenues? And I know you mentioned there, there could be uh, an audit done, or there is an annual audit done. Would that would be the only layer of the audit, not the council. The, the the fee wouldn't sunset in in that regard. So unless the fee were to be were to be changed. Now, if we did find ourselves in a situation whereby, um, I don't know, everybody got ten phones and all of a sudden we were bringing in ten million dollars, twelve million dollars worth of revenue, you know, then we would have to then look and say, hey, our our revenues now exceed those eligible expenditures. So we are going to need to to change that. Uh, but I think that's largely kind of a, a um, academic point at this point. I think in some of the language in that original bill is because. Originally, they had um, again that hard cap of 75 cents, and then a dollar 50. And the dollar 50 cap only lasted about a year or so before then they just they removed the cap. And so some of that language, I think, still kind of alludes back to like when there was to when there was the cap, and kind of um, uh, as far as then, then, when, then when the change was made to to make it for for no for no cap going forward. Okay. Um, will the increased funds be specifically earmarked, uh, maybe in a separate count that can only be in, used for the intended purposes, like similar to the 50% uh, of the transfer tax being used for the ag press? So it is part of the general fund, um, and there are uh, accounting rules through the Government Accounting Standards Board um, that says that we can only have a special revenue fund um, if, if the majority of the revenue comes from those revenue sources. So in the say, case of our ag transfer tax, all of that revenue that pays for ag transfer comes from that transfer tax, so it's eligible to be a special revenue fund. In this case, um, uh, there, there's still a, a high level of general fund dollars being used, so, so you really can't have that same, you would have to transfer money in from the general fund to pay that, um, more or less to offset that subsidy cost, if you will. Um, and so because of that, it's really not eligible for a special revenue fund. But again, we do the audit each and every year. Um, to, to, to make sure that we don't spend, or I'm sorry, bring in more than our eligible expenditures. And I think the projections uh, for the uh, FY23 were the uh, operating costs were $10.2 million, um, and the fee uh, would increase to 5.6, so roughly $15 million for dispatch. So um, would you subtract that, that um, $5.6 million to what you're – you're uh, allotting for the dispatch center, or would you give $15 million for all the increases of salaries, recruitment, and the updated software and equipment? Yeah, for the most part, I mean, those, those costs are already in, in play. And so if, if these fee increases weren't, uh, weren't approved, I don't believe that we would roll back these costs because these are uh, necessary public safety investments that, again, that we have to do because um, the citizens require them and also because of state mandates. And so any addition, we, if, there, if the fees weren't, um, uh, weren't increased, then that would just mean additional general fund dollars from taxes, uh, property taxes, income taxes, other revenue sources would have to cover off that difference. So just so I understand, so the $10.2 million uh, this next year you're going to still fund, and then whatever is an addition from the fees is going to be on top of that. So, no, the, so the fees, it's, it, I mean, we, we, we needed to act, I think, before the fees were, were, in, were, um, were implemented because of the, the, the dire need to, to meet these, these obligations um, that Director Ayers um, spoke about. Uh, but as part of the overall budget process, and this is true of any time where we have fees, you know, we try to create some type of relationship between the expenditure um, and being able to, um, to retrieve at least a, a significant portion of that related expenditure through the fees understanding that we're not going to be able to do it in its entirety. The only place where we do it in its entirety is water and sewer fund. That's the only place where the fees 100 percent cover um, the, the cost of the system. You know, whether you're talking about uh, building permits or you're talking about what we'll talk about next week with solid waste or um, here with 911 fees, um, you know, we, we kind of have this level of service that we need to provide um, and then we need to try to find um, a fair and, and reasonable and equitable um, fee structure to offset a significant portion of it, understanding that we'll still maintain that subsidy. Um, Mr. Ayers or, or Mr. Woods or Ross, uh, I, I remember hearing that there was a problem with the CAD system. Is this, uh, was there still a current problem with the CAD system, kind of generating the information and generating the reports that this would help out with? I mean, we, we have a running list of issues that we're always working with the CAD vendors to try to fix. Um, just like any 
communication center. I think there's always some issues that you're working on with the CAD system. Um, we, um, we feel like we're getting good support from the CAD vendor now to fix most of the issues, but um, I do have Deputy Director Bruneke studying our current CAD system right now to make sure that that is the system we want to continue to use going forward or whether we want to look at another system. Okay. So we are. We are this would help with that. Yes. Uh, and I think uh, you answered the one question. This is per line, not per bill. Correct. It's okay. per, per line, yes. All right. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. President. It's been a while since I said this, Mr. Bennett. <laughs> Life is good. Um, and I mean, we're talking about 75 cents per line and in increase, right? So I'll ride the Snoopy airplane at the mall one last time per year in order to cover the difference in my budget. 75 less cents per year in my budget to cover the difference. But you know, it's, it's 75 cents more in my phone bill, yeah, essentially. So, so for each, each phone bill, there would be a dollar fifty from the county and then fifty cents from the state. So right. Two two dollars um, in order to provide. But I was already paying seventy five cents. Correct. So it's just so. it's an extra seventy five cents. Yes. It's uh, yeah. I couldn't even buy a, a, a cheeseburger at McDonald's of seventy five cents. So it's it's really a nominal fee compared to the service that's being provided to the community by paying that seventy five cents. And what what we're doing with that, I just think. What was it? A little over a year ago, we had a 911 dispatcher come to the county council during public comment and share about the work that they do. And just, uh, you know, I, I think it's easy to forget just what they hear over and over again. And then they hang up the phone and the next call comes in and the work that they do. It's very, very difficult work, uh, emotionally draining work. Um, I, I just, I don't see the difficulty in supporting that, you know, 75 cents. <laughs> but to, to give that up in exchange for what they do, it just seems like a no-brainer as a community. What are we as a community if we can't support that as a function? But in addition to that, when that 911 dispatcher came, they asked for support in, um, in their retirement because, you know, other public safety workers, they retire earlier than them. And, you know, they have to go through just as much trauma, if not more, than a lot of public safety workers and what they're dealing with every single day. And to, to think about making it to retirement is almost impossible for a lot of them. And I just think that's something that is worth us continuing to explore, because I think that would be a great way for us to incentivize people coming to our county without necessarily raising um, uh, income levels because if people could in, uh, envision themselves retiring in Harford County they'd stay in Harford County knowing that you know they could finish their career here versus maybe not making it to their end of their career in a neighboring county so that was just a, a comment that we heard before I was on council but when I was listening to the meetings that I thought was uh, really worth considering because I had never realized just how much longer they had to work than some of our other public safety workers and that really touched me because just, you know, you make one traumatic phone call to 911, but then when that phone call's over, they're there to take care of the next person. And like you said, it's 200,000 phone calls a year. That's a lot. So, I, you know, I fully support this, but I really thank you for sharing and breaking down the costs. And, um, you know, I'll stop buying so many gumballs in exchange to support what you all do. But and, and to your point about the uh, retirement, we, we are talking to the Public Safety Advisory Board about a, trying to look at a public safety uh, retirement system going forward because our EMTs and paramedics on the street, they, they don't have it either. Mm -hmm. So it is something we're looking at going forward. I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Riley? I just got a couple of questions. Um, I see we got a projected deficit of $4.9 million in 24. Why wouldn't we increase it so we cover that deficit so we have that ability? I mean, we, we certainly have the legal, the legal rights. I mean, this kind of gets back to that question of how do we balance fees um, with, with general tax dollars to pay for government services? Um, you know, and I think with talking with the county executive and when you kind of look at what other counties are doing in, um, across, across Maryland, um, you see that that $1.50 range is where a lot of them are, are, are settling. Um, but again, we would have the legal right to increase that. And, 
you know, again, in the future, if, if there are additional costs um, that, that, would, that would necessitate that or um, if that deficit would, would continue to grow and crowd out other government spending, that certainly can be a conversation you know, we can have. But I would like to promote that uh, with the county executive, uh, that we could cover these costs through that. The other thing, uh, you said enroll, in, uh, enroll, Hickory, or enroll the townships into Hickory. I don't understand how that works. So right now, when we take a 911 call, for right, you county, transfer it. I got that. Transfer it. The law says we can't do that anymore. And so, how, what do you mean by enrolling them in? Are you so bringing them we're to the? We're going to put a planning team together to plan moving them into our dispatch center. Okay, and so their dispatch center will essentially just close down, Basically. and they'll be up in, in so your. They'll still have people that'll have to be there to greet public when they come. I understand that, but I'm talking about their. 911. And what's the average pay for a dispatcher? Uh, Ross, I'm going to defer to you on that. Sorry. Good afternoon. Uh, Ross Coates, I'm the manager of the 911 Center for the county. Um, thank you, council members. So, starting salary for our 911 specialist today is $44,000 a year. Um, I think it's important to note that we have a lot of single parents, people who are looking at this as a career opportunity, um, and they're dealing with your lives every day. Um, $44,000 hardly seems sufficient when you talk about the life-saving acts that happen every day in that center mm -hmm. that go unrecognized. Um, we do have career growth opportunities, um, but still, not where we need to be to be competitive in today's public safety 911 specialist market. So Ross, if I'm a 911 operator and I start out at 44, what can I top out at? Just being a 911 operator. Uh, so our career path requires you to promote into a public safety dispatcher two position, uh, which is a, uh, a radio dispatcher and a 911 call taker currently, uh, because we do have to have that flexibility. Uh, that is right around 52000 hmm. That's all, Mr. President. Thank you. Ross, while, while you're speaking, can you give just a couple brief examples without going into great detail some of the calls that our call takers take? I mean, we know, but I'd like you to give some sort of insight to the public. Absolutely. And, and in fact, we have one of our 911 specialists here with us today, Joy. Um, Joy Clark is uh, one of our 911 specialists today, but just some broad examples. We deal with the happy times, right? The childbirths, the um, situations where there's not an immediate life threat and we can bring happiness to somebody's crisis. Um, unfortunately, that's the rarity. Um, the things that we deal with on a daily basis are true crises. And people don't think that Oh, vandalism to your car overnight is a crisis, but to that person who's experiencing it, it's their worst day. And you're trying to coach them through this crisis, get the information you need, get the officers on scene to assist them, get the police report written, possibly look for clues, suspects, things of that nature. We deal with a lot of domestic violence in the county. Um, it's unfortunate, but it happens every day. There's, um, there's domestic violence with weapons, um, I think you all are probably very aware of the large fire that happened um, earlier this week. Um, many residents in the Edgewood community lost their homes. We deal with that on a daily basis. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is that our call volumes, not only are they increasing, but the acuity of these calls is increasing. And the public's expectation is increasing. And in order to try and meet these demands, that's where this legislation, if passed, helps us meet that demand and what that community really expects from us as a service provider. And in many cases, the dispatcher is giving details on life-sustaining efforts until the paramedics get there, correct? Absolutely. I mean, <coughs> we're, we're doing that every day. So not just life-saving, but how to get yourself out of a sinking vehicle how to get yourself out of a situation where you're not safe, where there's weapons involved, uh, how to get out of a burning building, how to deliver a child, how to do CPR. All of these things are things that our people are dealing with on a daily basis. 
Thank you, Mr. Jandrew Dan. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, Director Ayers, Director Sandlis, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Ross, question going back to the, the salary. Is that hourly or is that a salary wage? So we are paid hourly, um, and there is premium overtime involved um, when necessary. Unfortunately, it's more frequently than we would like to uh, admit that it is. Um, what is overtime? How many hours after they work, how many hours? Uh, so we can mandate up to four hours additional. Um, most of our staff are doing at least that in a pay period. Is that a 40 hour pay? 40, yeah, 40 so anything hours. over 40 yes. and they're okay. So that was, that was my one question. Cool. So, uh, you're, you're getting the, um, they, they are getting it over time. Um, when you hire somebody new and they come from another jurisdiction, and I know that's a big, uh, problem because surrounding counties, especially Baltimore County, they're, they're paying more, so you're not matching their salaries to bring them up here, correct? We are not. However, we do offer um, a slight lateral incentive of a 3% increase in your initial starting salary, so 3% above the 44000 uh, But that doesn't necessarily carry with you as you progress through that career pathway, right? Do you know what Baltimore County starts them at? I think they are at 43.8 right now, I believe. So the disparity comes in where the, the amount of years that they have and the pay raise that they yep. get that goes up. Yep. That's our, we're, not, we're not on par with them at that, this point. Okay. Yeah, we actually just, um, we lost a very qualified um, candidate uh, a week ago. Um, Baltimore County? Was working for another dispatch center um, and was looking at an opportunity with us. Um, but in, a, in the end, salary was the was the difference. Okay. And we just couldn't meet it. Well, wow. I want to thank you. I know it's a very stressful job being on the. No be problem. I just came up and he said, one thing he didn't mention, which I would like to mention, is the mental health crisis that we also have in our county. We get so many calls in reference to that. And something else that Ross did not mention is that a lot of people in the county have expectations for us to stay on the line with them during the call until help arrives, which obviously ties up the lines for others. And we can, in an emergency situation, get them off of the phone, but if they are in an emergency situation, we really can't. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. So the uh, projected expenditures at 10.9 from the 9.3, is that due to the 16 people that we're hiring in addition? Yeah, most of those were, um, were not part of the original fiscal year 23 budget. So uh, when uh, County Executive Cassidy came on, uh, one, of his, one of his first um, uh, major decisions was uh, was providing those 17 additional um, positions and also doing some salary enhancements. Um, so a lot of those are what we would call you know, mid-year budget adjustments, but they really will show up in the fiscal year 24 budget versus the original 23. So the the dispatchers that we're going to take from the from the municipalities, how many of those total are are, are we going to take in from there? I think Is that the 16? That, that, that's that's all of that part will then need to be determined. Um, so that's an additional. That, and so so and, and that just goes to show that that I do think that the cost that we're looking at will continue to grow. Um, whether that is if we need to add additional individuals for this, whether we need to look at our, our salaries, whether we continue to need to do other forms of technology upgrades. If we do ever do anything on the retirement side, that would also uh, uh, result in a, in a higher uh, budget because there would be a higher uh, pension payment, if you will. Um, so yeah, this this area is is uh, probably not ex uh, will will continue to grow and probably faster than than the rest of the budget. So if they're if they are a municipality employee, they're going to become a Hartford County employee. I, I believe all of this will. We will, we we're, we're we're in the very early stages of 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 this. We haven't, uh, had, our, we we, haven't had our first planning meeting. It, I got you. Are we going to get compensated? For, is the county going to get compensated from the municipalities for? For bringing these people in, that we're you know, now we, taking over their. We, we'll have to look at at the arrangements with you know, with with the towns as far as how that works. I do know, when we calculate our police aid to the towns, that there is a there is a nine one one component. So it's possible that that there could be a change in that formula, which could you know, re reduce some of that. But again, all of this will all need to be uh, discussed. It's very 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 preliminary. Gotcha. Um, each phone line. Is that only if the billing's in Hartford County? So if the billing, if a business is in Baltimore County and people live up here, yeah, that's there, not there, affected, There is correct? certainly yeah, some, some, some leakage with, with that type of arrangements. You know, people that are on um, 
mean, I do, normally when you do go and you, you have like a family billing and you might have say say your, your your mom and your dad are on your plan and they live in the they live in the next county over, um, you know, I believe that they're they're supposed to kind of track that to be like okay, there's two in Baltimore County and two in Harford County, uh, but there's probably no doubt that there's probably some. Thinking more businesses than, than family yeah, plans. Yeah, well, on the business, maybe perhaps so on the on the business cell phones uh, and the like. And it's difficult now with um, uh, with telephone numbers because you know like nowadays, whatever your cell phone number is, you're probably never going to change it. It's the only number I know. Um, so so you have plenty of people that have phone numbers from from kind of all over. Um, and I do think that's probably something that 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 the whole 911 system, some kind of statewide and nationwide, will need to 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 look at making sure that that's all aligned. And what about voice, uh, VoIP, where I'm working from home and I get a phone number from home? If it has the number, then yes. Because I, like, I know when, if you looked uh, for a while, when I had the Comcast triple play, I know that I had the, the 911 fee on that. I, I didn't even know what my number was with that triple play, but I know that I had a 911 fee attached to it. What I'm thinking is people that work at home, maybe in, their, in Baltimore City or something, and they get a phone number at home because they're using a VoIP. What, does yeah, that, if does that if count or if not? If it's billed to, if it if it is billed to, if it's got a separate number, it should be it should be covered under under that. If if um, but again, with some of the businesses, it, it can get it can get money. They're probably paying it somewhere, um, and you know this is this is one of those areas where really it's the state that administers this. And it, so how how this works is is I will, uh, uh, assuming that this is is all um, uh, passed. We'll, we'll let the comptroller lo know um, uh, that, that this action was taken. Um, also, uh, the Public Service Commission and the State Numbers Board. Um, but it's really the state that more or less is collecting the, the fee, and then they uh, send it to us in four quarterly uh, disbursements. Any other counties have the same uh, projected deficit, and are they are they more or less looking to raise their fees or get revenue from anywhere else? Is there to, to make up the difference, or is there always going to be a deficit, and they have a deficit, everybody has a deficit? You talk to a lot of these people. Yeah, I would, I, uh, so I know Carroll County raised their their rate to $1.50 uh, um, last year. I know that they're, that that's not going to cover all of their, their expenditures. I don't know of any county yet that, that has said, look, we are going to make this fee exactly what it, what it would be. If you think about it, if each... Um, if each 75 cents brings in uh, three million dollars, you know, um, with with about a five million dollar deficit, you know, you're, you you would be looking at a you know a dollar and a quarter or so of of probably of, a, of an additional fee you would need to do. So I haven't seen any other counties uh, do that. But you know, again, it it goes down to this is a it, anything that we don't bring in from this fee has to be covered with general fund dollars, which means that that's money that could otherwise be going to any other. Um, whether it's public safety or parks or, or education or anything else, um, it, it kind of goes after those same dollars. Um, but we don't really have the same discretion sometimes to say no to these expenditures. Um, you know, they're not as discretionary, if you will. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank, thank you for your presentation. One, one other thing that I failed to mention that I think is important. Now, I think everybody still thinks of the 911 call as just somebody picking up a phone and dialing 911 and calling that way. Now we have the technology. If people don't want to call 911, they can text to 911. And this next gen 911 also is going to allow us where people can send videos and pictures wow. into the 911 center when they're calling in the emergency. And before the responders even get to the scene, we're going to be able to share pictures and videos with their responders. So imagine if you're a police officer responding to a call or you're a fire chief responding to a call and you have that technology at your hand even before you get there. And that's where we're going. Is, is the next gen, I, I remember working on the next gen when we were on here, and that's, is that up and running? So the, the text, the 911 feature is already there. Okay. Some of it's still in the process. And I know that that gave better pinpointing of people in cell phones for, for where they're at. I, I don't even think people realize that you know, when these uh, massive storms come through and everything that, you know, people, you know, are using that as well as 911 emergency, you know, all that if kind of stuff. If we have somebody abducted and they call 911, we can pretty much pinpoint the geographic location where that person is. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Guthrie. I've got some of my questions were answered, but I've got a couple. Talk about a cell phone for a minute. How does, uh, uh, how does is the fee put on a cell phone? For instance, uh, Let's say somebody from Baltimore County has a 
Baltimore County phone, cell phone, whatever, in Baltimore County comes in Harford County, something happens and they have to dial 911. Um, how, does, how is the fee charged to a cell phone? And particularly in today's world, because so many people, they no longer have line, landlines. Yeah, you know, they just it have would, cell. It would, be, it would be to where, um, to, to where the home address of, of the individual um, resides. And this is where, more often than not, that's, not, that's going to be the billing. But uh, again, if you had a situation where you had, um, you, a lot of people have family plans, and you know, they might have their parents or their brothers and sisters on them, and they may be, there, there are uh, um, ways that it is supposed to go back to wherever that individual lives, um, lives respectively. But I think a lot of times it probably just ends up going to wherever it's, it's billed, um, unless those, those fields are always filled out. Um, but if you call 911 and you're, you're from out of state, I mean, it's, and, and you, you call 911, if I'm not speaking that term, but if you're on, a, on a cell phone and you're from New York City and you're driving through 95, it's going to go to you guys. Yep. And, and, and if you go down the road and go into Baltimore County, it'll, it'll then go to Baltimore County. So uh, then um, I guess that may be the, maybe that's uh, the minuscule part. I don't know, but uh, I just don't know how do the, you get the fees from them. I mean, I think you're always going to have any. You're always going to have some. Anytime animals. you have um, you, visitors from out of out of areas, um, you, you're probably going to have have some of that. You know, it's, um, some some of those things. You know, those individuals probably aren't really paying for a lot of our police and fire and, and, and safety and um, things like that. Um, so you're probably going to have that in any in any community. And I think you also touched on this. I, I noticed in the, in the 22. Uh, you have an over six million dollar deficit, and then twenty three you have over seven million. Then you drop down, which it's helped a little bit. In twenty four, you have a four over four million dollar deficit. So, I, I think you touched on this. Um, uh, the, I mean, deficit means you have to have that money to operate. It, it okay. Means that, yeah. That, so that what, the general so, fund is is subsidizing it. With really, property taxes and income taxes are covering up the shortfall. Um, and the reason why it got a little bit better is that when they went in 2020 from doing it per bill to doing it per line, because then you had situations where you might have a business that might have 10 phones or you might have an individual with a family plan. You know, we, that's where we went from picking up. I just aren't what they used to be. Um, that's where we went from, from bringing in about 1.8 million to about 2.8 million. So we did see a, a significant increase um, you know, from that from that change. All right, thank you. And Mr. Ayers, I'd like to thank you because every time you yell or call him or call in or something, my wife says, there goes that Mr. Ayers again. We got a problem. <laughs> thank you very much, brother. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. Anyone else? Um, Ms. Dixon, do we have anyone signed up? We do, Mr. President. We have two this evening, Joy Clark followed by Bob Tibbs. Okay. Good evening, ma'am. Name and address for the record, please. It's Joy Clark, 418 Crisfield Drive, Abingdon. Um, I'm here to speak as a 911 dispatcher, again on 22-23. Mr. Bennett, I'm the same one that was here last year speaking on retirement and tax credits. So I'm very much forward, and a lot of our dispatchers are forward and for this resolution. Seven years ago, we did not have the technology that we have now. Rapid SOS is a integrated software that works through our phone system that allows us like basically uber technology on pinpointing someone to their exact spot. Seven years ago, a call came in and we were phase one or phase two trying to figure out where these people are screaming for help and we have no idea. It would take so long. Technology is so important to us. When people pick up the phone, they want results. They don't want, well, what's your address? Or I can't find where you're at. They want you to know. They expect <clears throat> that. So that's what the expectations from the uh, community are. When it comes to hiring, um, which this is included, hiring is difficult because retention is a problem. It is very hard to do this job and not everybody is cut out with it. And they could get through the academy, get out on the floor, be doing a great job, and suddenly say, you know what, this is just not for me. It's too stressful. I can't deal with this every day. So retaining the people that we already have is also just as important as hiring people. But as it also stated in their proposal, um, 
there's inadequacies in the amount of numbers that we are having, how, how long it takes to answer the phone. Those inadequacies need to be addressed not only by hiring new people, but by increasing the shift minimums for each shift that's on the floor so there are more dispatchers, not in general, but on that shift answering those calls. So again, I'm here to, to um, say I think it's a great idea. I, I'm, I'm actually surprised that it's only $1.75. I think people would pay more. I know there's a law. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Name and address, Good please. Evening. Bob Tibbs, 3545 Old Level Road, Havity Grace. I'm not here. I'm kind to just want to make some comments that I think that we need to go into our dispatchers and check out the protocol. We're having a little difficulty right now, as I understand, uh, uh, getting rid of getting people on the road for ambulances. I can cite one last week. It happened at our farm. We had an employee who got hurt. My wife was scared to death. She called an ambulance. I wasn't home. I came home. She says, get up here. We got an ambulance on the way. So I looked. I said, well, how long has this been? She says, it's been a couple, of three minutes. You know how time goes by. And um, so here comes volunteers in from level in their cars. Here comes the ambulance the level ambulance in, followed by a ambulance from Haverty Grace, followed by a county ambulance coming up the road and coming in. So there's three ambulances on one call within, I don't know, five or six minutes. And the fellow from level says, we did not get the call. It's less than a mile from my house. So somewhere along the line, we need to check the protocol at fire headquarters and check things out. I was the EMT for over 30 years. I, I understand the, the uh, predicament that they're in. I do support uh, some of the funding, but on the other hand, we've got to look within before we go way outside. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Tibbs. Anyone else? There are no more speakers, Mr. President. Mr. Ayers, at some point, will you reach out to Mr. Tibbs? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, with no other speakers, this will conclude the public hearing for Resolution 22-23. And if I may, I'd like to call to order Legislative Session Day 23-012. I'd ask you to please join us in standing for the pledge and the following prayer by Councilman Guthrie. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We bow our heads. Dear Lord, hear our prayer as we come before you. Soften our hearts during this time when there's so much pain and suffering exists in the world. Recently, the U.S. Senate chaplain uh, for the past 20 years, Barry Black urged lawmakers after the Nashville shooting, school shooting to, quote, move beyond thoughts and prayers because, quote, there comes a time when action is required and talking needs to stop. I agree. He also said, Eternal God, we stand at all with you. Mr. Black prayed, Lord, when the bodies, when the babies die, at the church school, it is time for us to move beyond thoughts and prayers. Remind our lawmakers of the words of the British statement, Edmund Black, that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Council, if I may, uh, I was just advised that our closed captioning is now working live. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that. I want to send my congratulations to not only our staff in-house, but also the IT department for making this happen. I also want to take a minute to uh, welcome uh, Councilman Bennett back to the dance. It's a pleasure to see you. 
And with that, I'll move on to agenda item number four, presentation of proclamations. But prior to that, if I may, I'd like to have Ms. Kathy McFadden, uh, Laura Metz, uh, and anyone else that's with you this evening come forward uh, to give us a presentation on uh, Fair Housing Month. Whenever you're ready. Ma'am. Good evening, President Council. President. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good evening, Council President Vincini and other members of the Council. We thank you for letting us come tonight before you to celebrate the National Fair Housing Month. I'm Kathy McFadden, the CEO of the Harford County Association of Realtors. I think all of you pretty much know us. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce Brianna Stevens. She's the chair of our Inclusive Diversity, Equity, and Awareness Committee, which is also known as the IDEA Committee. She'll be talking tonight about how our association tries to ensure that the members and the residents of Harper County have fair housing. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much, Kathy. And thank you to the County Council for inviting the Harford County Association of Realtors here tonight. Um, so as you just heard, April is Fair Housing Month and beginning with the Fair Housing Act in 1968, Congress began uh, putting in place several protected classes. <laughs> um, and this was due to, at the time, so many disparities that were in the selling and renting of housing. Since then, we've come a long way the state of Maryland as well as Harford County have uh, added on to that and have added protected classes. So in lieu of that, in spirit of that, the Harford County Association of Realtors has a Fair Housing Task Force. And our Fair Housing Task Force every year invites school age children to participate in a Fair Housing Poster Contest. This year, the theme for our Fair Housing Poster Contest was, Will You Be My Neighbor? So we want to take a second to just thank all of the students who participated in that and let them know that they are appreciated. Um, and we are also going to take a moment to... <laughs> there were over 80, 80 children or 90 children who participated in this. <laughs> we <sure>. want... <laughs> we so want you want to come forward? Yeah, we want to invite forward our five winners to be recognized. So for our middle school, first place was Cameron Almond. For the elementary school category, first place is Olivia Chin. Second place, Amina Surgeon. Third place, Paul Knox. And for our honorable mention, we have Graylin Gillian. And we also have a Waverly Pe uh, Parson. She was unable to attend tonight. Also on these um, pictures, we got to grade them all and um, it was amazing. A lot of them were in different languages. They had, I think this one right here had different languages. What, so that, it was really cool. Um, I was so amazed what our uh, children were able to do. And we have them all over our walls in the association office. So President Vincini, come by and see them. Okay, all right. Well, yes. thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation real quick. Um, we're gonna go ahead and read in this proclamation if ladies you'd like to join me up front. Whereas April 2nd, 2023 marks the 55th anniversary of the passage of the U.S. Fair Housing Law, Title uh, Eight of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 as amended, which enunciates a national policy of fair housing with regard to race, color, creed, national origin, sex, familiar status, and handicap 
and encourages fair housing opportunities for all citizens and whereas the Hartford County Association of Realtors is committed to highlight the fair housing law title eight of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 by continuing to address discrimination in the community to support programs that will educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities and to plan partnership efforts with their organizations to help assure every American of their right to fair housing. Now, therefore, we, the County Council of Hartford County, Maryland, on this 11th day of April, 2023, do hereby proclaim Fair Housing Month, April 2023, which begins a year-long commemoration of U.S. Fair Housing Law in Hartford County and urges all citizens to wholeheartedly recognize this celebration throughout the year. Thank you, Councilman. So I want to congratulate all of you uh, on your artwork. Um, much better than I could have done, I'm sure. So uh, congratulations. Kathy, I want to thank all of you for the opportunities and the services that you provide all of our communities uh, throughout the year on a regular basis. And I want to thank you for coming here tonight with your presentation. And uh, congratulations. Thank you very This is really a great moment when we have all these young people that are really committed to understanding what fair housing is all about. You should see our wall. We have 90 pictures, 80 or 90 pictures all over our wall. They are amazing. One of the things I heard not too long ago um, about an artist ask adults, how many of you can draw? Nobody raised their hand. They ask high schoolers, how many of you can draw? Nobody raised their hand, maybe one or two. They ask Grade school, junior high, several raised their hand. But they asked the kindergartners, and they all raised their hands. That's what we need to get back to, and understanding how to draw and actually making something out of this that is amazing. Look at these pictures. If they can walk around the room, that'd be great. And you're welcome to stop by our association office and see these pictures. It is truly amazing. They, are, they will be um, put out on our Facebook page. I think they've been uh, out there a couple times, so please look at it. We're very proud of them. Thank you. Stand next to her. She is taller than you, Jacob. <laughs> I miss kindergarten. <laughs> Pain. Yes, at least they'll get something done. <laughs> um, as you heard earlier, this is National Telecommunications Week. And um, if I may, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Ayers and Mr. Woods and Mr. Brennicky come forward, please. Again, you've heard a lot about the 911 Center tonight. Back in the 1990s, Congress recognized this week as the National Telecommunicator Week. And um, my career in Hartford County spans 39 years with the 911 Center. And I've always said that I felt like the people that work in the 911 Center are really the unsung heroes. I mean, I, 
I don't think it's as bad today as what it was 20 or 25 years ago. I think more people are realizing the importance of what our people do in the 911 center. But I want to thank Deputy Director Brunicky, Deputy Director Woods, uh, Ross Coates, who manages the 911 center, Joy Clark. Um, so on behalf of all of the people that work in our 911 center, um, I just really appreciate you having us here tonight to recognize what they do. Um, certainly, I, I'm prejudiced because this has been my career, but I really do think we have so many outstanding people that work in the 911 center. Um, President Vincenti called me today and wanted me to speak a little bit about the, uh, also the EMS transition. Do you want me to do that now? Um, so along with the importance of answering the 911 calls is the dispatching of the fire, police, and EMS service. And I know that um, some of you are aware of all the work we're doing right now on transitioning the EMS service under our department. Uh, that kind of came to us quickly earlier this year when the EMS foundation that was formed uh, right after 9-11 back in the early 2000s as a way to supplement the volunteers in Hartford County. It was originally intended to only be a short gap solution of, that was supposed to supplement the volunteers for four or five years. And here we are in 2023, over 20 years later, um, they finally came to the county and said, we can't do it anymore. We really need the county to step in and um, transition this to county government. So um, I put a team together in February, and I'm happy to say we're only two months into this. And in the month of April, we will have transitioned five medic units uh, from that transition into our force. We put our we already had three county medic units in service, so the one we put in service at Faustin this past Saturday, um, we now will have eight county medic units in service. And um, to Mr. Tibbs' concern, and I haven't looked into it yet, certainly I will, but one of the things that um, the foundation was still doing was some stations only had a driver, some stations only had an EMT, so we were sending multiple units from different stations to try to patch a crew together. Once this transition is completed, then we won't have to do that anymore. When we, when we have this fully rolled out, hopefully sometime later this year, we'll have 15 staffed medic units in the county. And um, so I'm really looking forward to the challenge ahead. My team has did an outstanding job. And so that's kind of giving you an update on where we are with the EMS thing, along with uh, thanking our dispatch personnel. Thank you. Uh, Council, just briefly, real quick, does anyone have any questions at all? All right. Okay, Mr. Chandra Dana. How many uh, units are there total EMS in the county? I know you said we're going to have 15. How many do we have with all the um, foundation now? So a couple months ago, we were averaging on any given day only seven or eight staff medic units in the county. And that's the reason why we were having so many challenges and delays in response. Um, from the time a call is dispatched from the 911 center, and this is why it's all connected, but by the time a call is dispatched, the national standard is we should have an ambulance on scene within eight minutes. And we're not there. We're over eight minutes. So we're hoping after we fully transition this under the county, we can get under that eight minute mark, which is a national standard that we want to achieve. And um, I see good things ahead, but we're not there yet. Okay, 15, are we, are we gonna go above 15 or what's so the we're plan? We're gonna start with 15, which also would include us transitioning um, Bel Air Fire Company, which has their own service. They've asked the county to take their operation over Joppa Magnolia had their own service. They've already came to us and told us they wanted uh, us to take their service. The only one that we still don't have a 100% commitment on yet is the uh, city of Aberdeen, town of Aberdeen. So we're, we met with Aberdeen Fire Company's board of directors. They're evaluating whether they're going to continue doing it themselves or whether they would want the county to take, um, take it over. But once once all of that would be incorporated, including the three towns, we would, we would have 15 staff medic units. Thank you very much. 
Um, Mr. Penn. Um, thank you um, for going into the EMS uh, side. This is probably a question better for Mr. Sainless than you as far as budgetary uh, concerns. Um, I know the foundation was a cost to the county, and I know this is probably increased costs, or maybe it's cost neutral, budget neutral. Do, do you have any idea on increased costs to the new well, EMS? I think we were out? averaging around eight or nine million dollars a year that we were giving the foundation to operate. Um, certainly, this is going to cost the county more than that eight or nine million dollars. Um, but we, oh, I didn't know Robbie was still here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. I didn't realize you were still here either. Yeah. Okay, Robbie. I'll get that. Now, and, and I don't, and I don't do not have um, do not have all the numbers um, in in front of me. But I do think that with the increased billing, and we'll talk about this at a at a later date, with um, the billing coming over to the county side, um, that that a lot of those additional costs will be somewhat muted. But there, it is going to be again an, an, an increase in overall expenditures, and a lot of it will be one time expenditures as we kind of try to get get up to speed, and we'll be bringing forth um, a resol um, a budget transfer soon. Uh, to try to capture a lot of those one-time costs that we're going to have this uh, this year before we, we, we go into an ongoing um, or kind of recurring cost, if you will. And I'm assuming the one-time one costs are ambulances, yeah, equipment. Yeah, really the ambulances. You know, I mean, we're in the process now of, of looking at, at um, uh, purchasing ambulances, whether they're new, whether they're used. Um, and so there, is, there will be some considerable one-time costs as we, we more or less you know, staff a, a, a completely new operation almost from the ground up. Do you uh, have a timeline on when that presentation will be as far as any it, of the increase? Well, it, it's, well, we'll, we would definitely need a budget transfer before the end of the year in order to um, uh, facilitate all this. I would assume that it will be, we're working on trying to get that legislation over here for, to be introduced next week, hopefully, which would then mean that the public would be a, what would that be, the third, third Monday in May, more than likely. Um, so I, something, that's, that's certainly what we're shooting for. All right. Thank you. Mr. Riley. I, I heard when I was out there uh, on Saturday, 6 o'clock in the morning, taking pictures about acquiring AMBOs. Aren't we acquiring the AMBOs that the uh, volunteers have? So that is, that is part of this. We're, we're purchasing ambulances from the volunteer fire companies. And what would they do with them if you didn't purchase them? So some of the volunteer fire companies are still going to try to maintain volunteer crews. We don't want to do away with volunteers. Okay. So if... if uh, some of the fire companies that still have volunteers that want to ride, we will. The only stipulation is, is they have to have a volunteer crew in the station. They have to let our dispatch center know they're attended, and we'll dispatch them as a volunteer crew. Okay. So that's why some of the, some of the fire companies will keep their ambulances. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. And trained. What's that? And trained. Yeah. So, gentlemen, if you will join me up front, please. Yeah. All of you, please. And Ms. Clark. Can you stand, please? Not you, you're going to read Okay, you sit down. Whereas the President and Congress of the United States have established the second week of April each year as National Telecommunication Week and Whereas each year hundreds of citizens and visitors to Hartford County call 911 to summon help for emergencies such as dwelling fires, motor vehicle accidents, medical and law enforcement related emergencies, and whereas the Hartford County Department of Emergency Services has a well-trained, highly professional team of dispatchers working in the 911 center, and whereas public safety dispatchers are the single vital link between responding law enforcement, fire, and EMS personnel by monitoring their radio traffic, thus providing them valuable information to ensure their safety and well-being. Now, therefore, we, the County Council of Hartford County, Maryland, on this 11th day of April, 2023, do hereby proclaim National Telecommunications Week, April 9th through the 15th, 2023. The entire County Council of Hartford County thanks all the telecommunications and dispatchers in the Department of Emergency Services for their dedication and professionalism on keeping the citizens of Hartford County safe throughout the year. Thank you, Councilman. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this many, many times, about the value that our dispatchers bring to this public safety uh, in the county, and uh, you hit it 
unsung heroes, that's it. Yep. Um, so I know that we as elected officials have opportunities every now and then to visit the EOC. Do you ever open it to public for them to come? I mean, we'll do tours um, that we can be part of. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if a tour group wants to come and see the 911 center, we can arrange that. They just need to call and let us know. I think it's uh, extremely valuable to most of our citizens to have an opportunity firsthand to walk in and see the capabilities that we have here in Harford County. Uh, when we went to Mako and we sat up uh, this past, I guess, or last summer actually, uh, we had Harford County set up in Ocean City taking calls, live calls, and dispatching back here in the county. It's just absolutely amazing. So I want to congratulate you and thank you for all that you do. Each one of you. Thank you. And if if uh, anyone would like to say anything, Joe, I can't believe I, I've it. talked enough. Okay. <laughs> I'll stand. Joe, don't want to talk. <laughs> yeah, I got to say. I'm kicking him under the table. <laughs> <laughs> to me. Mr. Bennett needs to get thicker soles. Or a box, something to stand on. Agenda item number five, consideration of petitions, applications, appointments, and nominations, we have none. Six, special presentations, we have none. Seven, approval of minutes, public hearing April 4th, 2023, legislative day 23-011, April 4th, 2023. Are there any corrections to the minutes? There being no corrections, the minutes stand approved. Agenda item number eight, introduction and consideration of resolutions. Resolution 018-23, Master Water and Sewer Plant Update Spring 2023. May I have a motion? Council President, I move to approve the resolution 018-23. have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Penman. It's been seconded to approve resolution 018-23. Is there any discussion? Ms. Dixon. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Guthrie. Aye. Mr. Penman. Aye. Mr. Jan Giordano. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. There being six votes in the affirmative, one absent. The amendment res or the resolution 01823 is hereby approved. Resolution 01923, MS4 Financial Assurance Plan 2023 may I have a motion. Council President, I move to approve the resolution 019-23. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 019-23. Is there any discussion? Mr. Bennett. Um, I just wanted to share that I did reach out to the county executive today to clarify, um, you know, why are we having more uh, retirees than expected? Um, just to in, ensure that uh, it wasn't due to, like, uh, we're expecting to, is, it, is this the wrong? The next one, Mr. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize. That's I okay. got my numbers mixed up. That's quite all right. I'm rusty. That's a quite all right. <laughs> and my we're, chair was dusty. We're going to give know. you a second shot. Uh, anyone else? Miss Dixon. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Guthrie. Aye. Mr. Penman. Aye. Mr. Jan Giordano. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. There being six votes in the affirmative, one absent. Resolution 01923 is hereby approved. Agenda item number nine, introduction to bills. We have none. Ten, introduction and consideration of amendments. We have none. Eleven, call for final reading of bills. Bill 23-007, Appropriation Special Pays.
May I have a motion? Council President, I move to approve Bill 23-007. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Riley. It's been moved and seconded to approve Bill 23-007. Is there any discussion? Mr. Bennett. There we go. All right, so I did reach out to the county executive today just to clarify, you know, why are we having more uh, retirees than expected? Is it that we're incentivizing it? Are we trying to shrink a department? You know, um, with the uh, budget coming up very shortly, I just wanted to make sure um, that we had clarity on that. And he assured me it, it's not anything along those lines, um, that it's just that there's people who are at retirement and you can't necessarily always get that number exactly right when you build a budget, and, and that's the case here. So I was glad to be able to clarify that, and that made me a lot more uh, comfortable looking at this. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Anyone else? Ms. Dixon. Mr. President. Aye. Mr. Guthrie. Aye. Mr. Penman. Aye. Mr. Jan Giordano. Aye. Mr. Riley. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. There being six votes in the affirmative, one absent, Bill 23-007 is hereby approved. Agenda item 12, enrollment of bills. Bill 23-007, appropriation special pays, is certified as being the text finally passed. 13, unfinished business, we have none. 14, new business, we have none. 17, comments from input from attending citizens. Yes, Mr. President, it looks like we have seven this evening. Very well. Again, um, as I've always said, um, be mindful of your time and respectful of each other. Call your first speaker. Janine LaCour, followed by Holly McComas. Good evening, ma'am. Name and address, please. Janine LaCour, 1820 Park Beach Drive in Perryman. And I just wanted to um, comment um, to a lot that's been going on in our community. Um, for, uh, through the past uh, month or so, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people around the county um, and actually across the state. And um, one thing that as a reoccurring theme is people are concerned about the safety. Um, they're also concerned about an excessive um, um, amount of tractor trailers that are on our roads. And I've even had people, again, I've been all over the state for a variety of reasons, but it just keeps coming up. And it's been commented about how beautiful and pristine Harford County has been. And um, recognizing that Harford County is, is somewhat at a pivotal point, at a cusp of where do we want the direction of the county to go. And um, we can continue on this path that we've been on, um, creating um, just horrible, conditions for the citizens, um, or we can pause and stop and think about what is it, what kind of legacies do we want to leave for the generations behind us? Um, we're um, paving over um, historic property at the expense of um, outside um, interests who have no interest in what's happening here in the county. I was at the Harford 250 celebration and our um, 3T booth was inundated with citizens um, throughout the county who were concerned with what is happening all over the county. Municipalities are talking about um, problems that they're having um, with oversized trucks that are coming through their roads. So it's just an excessive problem um, that is throughout our county. Um, we have choices um, and we can make really hard choices now um, that will have a long lasting um, um, impact for our for generations to come um, and what really needs to be at top of mind are the citizens the voices of the citizens um, it's wonderful that as um, Perryman we have an elective official now representing us so we greatly appreciate that process I know it was a difficult process so uh, thank you Jacob um, but our voices need to be heard, and our voices are much more important than, as I said, outside interests. So I really just respect or respectfully ask that the um, county council um, set aside um, preconceived notions um, and look at the facts, uh, look at the quality of life that we're creating here in the county, 
and think about what it is that you want your legacy to be. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Good evening, ma'am. Name and address, please. Good evening. Holly McComas, 1826 Park Beach Drive, Aberdeen. I was driving along a deplorable pot-filled road which crosses the B&O Road, uh, I'm sorry, the B&O Railroad track that was Abingdon Road. Abingdon Road at the end of Route 40 uh, is, is the cross street there. Um, the bridge that goes over the railroad tracks has a restricted sign. It says single unit 20,000 pounds, combo unit 36,000 pounds. And I've seen this many times, I've grown up there. And I thought to myself, what after seeing many tractor trailers driving over this bridge, a semi pulling an empty trailer is estimated at 3,500 pounds, empty. Loaded, it's typically 80,000 pounds. I get this, I, I looked up four different websites to get that, to get that information and it all, they, they were all the same. So that's what I have to go by. This is a bridge, um, that has these restrictions, the tractor trailers drive over regularly. Um, the bridge is in need of repairs. Living in the community, I can't tell you the first time I heard that the bridge needed repairs. We're going back years. That project was pushed back because of another project on Route 7, which was pushed back another time because of the pro other project um, over top of 95 on Abingdon Road. Um, can you imagine if that bridge were to crumble with a tractor trailer on it and a train underneath carrying who knows what? This is my town and this is my concern, especially after hearing the news with other trains and accidents that have happened. The current infrastructure does not support the current traffic in Perryman and surrounding areas. And I've said this for several weeks now, I just wanna make sure it's heard. This was told to us by law enforcement, specifically said they cannot enforce laws due to inadequate infrastructure as it is now. The freight distribution centers of Harford County keep getting bigger while nothing happens to improve the infrastructure that is trying to support it. In our survey, 93% of those surveyed do not feel safe driving on the roads in Perryman. That's just in Perryman, and I can only imagine if you take that survey outside of Perryman. I've given you several other statistics from our survey, but after listening to what, what, what was happening, especially with the 911 uh, improvements that they're requesting, I wanna thank you for considering those 911 improvements because the roads the increasing um, unrealized approved construction already, we're gonna need them more than ever. So please consider the 911 improvements for our community. Thank you, ma'am. John Malamo followed by Henry Gibbons. Name and address, please. Sir, good evening to you and your colleagues. John P. Malamo, 2402 Eagle View Drive. Chapter two, when the code is inconvenient, ignore it. The mischief begins. Airport owners group submitted an application for a special exception to operate a general aviation airport as a permitted use on October 16th, 2013, zoning case 5814. The secondary purpose was to obtain approval of the expansion project which would be permitted as a matter of right for a permitted use. We note that the application was for an airport and only for the airport property at 3538 Aldino Road. The commercial operation was not part of the application. There are no approach and landing paths and no accessory uses and only one runway. The MAA approved layout plan was not submitted. On its face, the application was incomplete. The Department of Planning and Zoning considered only the application the information in the application and compared the application with the code and recommended approval. Statement on operations within the Ag and Industrial Districts. Applicant submitted a plan entitled Operation Exhibit which details the proposed commercial operations 
within the ag and GI districts. A total of 62% of the commercial airport operation will be located in the GI district. The remaining 38 will be located in the ag district. Statement on accessory uses. Appropriate airport accessory uses such as restaurants, snack bars, automobile rental agencies, airline business offices and service facilities, but not other businesses or industrial uses may be permitted. Statement on approach and landing paths. The applicant shall obtain all applicable state and federal permits to construct and operate the airport. The airport shall be operated in accordance with all applicable state and federal regulations concerning the operation of a public use airport. Statement on fueling aircraft in a fully enclosed building. Applicant is proposing to construct numerous hangars for the short storage of aircraft on the site. Commercial maintenance and servicing shall only be permitted within those hangars that meet the 200-foot setback requirement as shown in the applicant's site plan entitled Special, Ex Ex Special Exception Exhibit. The staff report was signed by the Chief of Site Planning and Building Permits Review, Mr. Shane P. Grimm, who is now the Director of Planning and Zoning. The Deputy Director, who has since retired, also signed. The recommendation for approval is a gross error as related to the commercial operation. It is not the commercial operation prescribed in the zoning code. It is an unauthorized change to the zoning code and defeats its purpose. It effectively reduces the scoop, scope of the commercial operation by excluding approach and landing paths, eliminates approach and landing paths from consideration, approval, access, and use, limits the operation to the airport property at 3538 Aldino, compounds zoning and land use problems at the airport, and it confuses zoning and land use processes in Harford County. Good night. Good evening, sir. Name and address, please. Henry Gibbons, 2402 Papaya Road, Edgewood. Um, Jacob, welcome back. Councilman Bennett, welcome back. It's good to see that the, the residents of uh, District F now have uh, proper representation. Um, and, um, you know, we're we, we acknowledge that these are sometimes these are sometimes hard-fought battles. We've had um, a lot of that, a lot of that kind of activity, both on the in the legal space and the political space, lately. And I was comforted to see, or, or glad to see, your picture uh, today on the the Harford County government page with the county executive, who was uh, who's we I commend for graciously accepting. Uh, the legal verdict handed down by the Maryland Supreme Court. Um, it's, and I want to use that as kind of a model for, for us. We are all engaged in pitched battles here, um, legal and political and, and advocacy and otherwise, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, we all have to live together. And we all have to respect the outcome of our political institutions whether those be our elections, whether those be our, uh, our legal institutions, our judiciary, uh, and we have to do so graciously because if we don't, we're in very serious trouble. And so I, I really want to uh, thank everybody who is involved in this uh, for, their, for their hard work in that, in that fight and uh, commend uh, everybody for pursuing uh, pursuing this through the channels that are that are available to us as a citizenry, it, uh, and uh, um, and you know we're we're glad the outcome came out the way it did, um, and um, we're we're glad to see that people are respecting that uh, as as the the uh, legal outcome of that of of, of that process. So uh, I challenge all of us in this room together to um, continue to uh, advocate for those things for which, we, for which we believe strongly. You see a very good contingent here from the P3 group who are doing just that. Um, we see other people doing the same for other causes, and I promise we will, I will do the same for the causes that I advocate for. But at the end of the day, we all have to come back and, and uh, we have to live together as a community. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I challenge I challenge everybody here, and I will uh, accept uh, accountability for for, the, for whenever I step over the line. Hopefully, I don't, but uh, I certainly hope to uh, adhere to those standards myself. So, um, with that, thanks. I appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thank you, sir. Paul Falacci, followed by Emma Peller. 
Good evening, sir. Name and address, please. Good evening. Uh, Paul Falacci, 320 Marina Avenue in uh, Perryman. Um, just wanted to welcome uh, Councilman Bennett back to this. It's good to see uh, District F seat filled um, this evening, and uh, hopefully it will stay filled. <laughs> um, and uh, I wanted to highlight, I like the teal in your tie, uh, President Vincente. It looks, it looks good. Um, I have uh, one question for this evening. I was just curious if there's going to be legislative sessions for the council in July and August. No, sir. We are looking at possibly being on summer break. Has not been approved yet. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Emma Peller, 1447 Redfield Road, Bel Air. Hello, Council, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. First, I wanted to thank you and Hartford TV for adding those live captions onto the meeting tonight to increase accessibility uh, for the county. I'm also here to once again ask you to review part one, section I, subsection four of the County Council Rules of Procedure. If you're unfamiliar, this section reads, comments permitted to be made by citizens during agenda item number 17 are generally permissive, except that matters which are the subject of a public hearing, such as bills, may not be addressed until the legislative session day which follows final action on the matter, and pending zoning cases may not be addressed until concluded and the expiration of all appeal rights has occurred. I still struggle to understand the rationale behind this procedure. I don't understand why someone can come in front of this council and talk about you know, books that they don't like that may or may not be in HCPS libraries, which is not under the jurisdiction of the county council, but they can't discuss a bill that will be voted on within the month. That to me is just not you know, open participation. So I always try to start my comments thanking the council for the opportunity to speak, and I truly do appreciate the chance. What I'm asking is you consider revising this to make it a truly open forum where people can talk about their grievances that they have and also upcoming legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peller. And be mindful to thank County IT Division, too, because they were a large, large part of this, uh, bringing closed captioning to be. Thank you. Kate McDonald. Good evening, ma'am. Name and address, please. Good evening. Kate McDonald, 2100 Park Beach Drive, Perryman. Welcome back, Mr. Jacob. We're glad you're here. Um, like our fight, it was a fight that needed to be fought, and I'm glad it, it came out the way it did. Um, tonight, I want to talk about public safety. I think you were all sent a video earlier this week, or was it last week? I can't remember, of a situation over on Old Post Road. I was the person in the car. Um, but what I want to talk about is what happened before I started rolling the, the footage and what happened after. Um, I sat there for about five to seven minutes and I called Aberdeen PD and like she does, she says, we're sending a unit out. I said, that's great. I said, I had a line of cars behind me. Uh, the peop cause both sides of the road were, were backed up with about nine trucks on each side. So the cars behind the trucks on the westbound lane were cutting around, coming through. And then the cars behind me, once it got clear, were, were passing me pretty quickly to, to go on the eastbound lane to cut back over. I'm, hopefully you watch the video since public safety is, should be your number one issue. Ms. McDonald, I can assure you we watched the video. Okay. We watched it with members of your group. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so once I got back over and I saw the, the truck in, in my lane, um, and there were two cars before me, that's when I stopped rolling, so, because I had to figure out what to do. So the cars in front of me had to go up on the berm to get around the truck, who the truck driver was irate, flipping us off. You know, he was very upset, understandably so. He was in the same pickle we were. So I got around, and then I stopped, and I waited for the police to show up, another five to seven minutes. So that's a total of 10 to 14 minutes that both lanes on this road were tied up. Mm -hmm. So had an ambulance been stuck where I was stuck, that's, that's kind of a significant delay to someone that's waiting on emergency help. So all that's to say is, you know, we don't need any more trucks on our roads. 
they're not built to, to handle what we have. I mean, if you don't see that, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't have any words for you. So anyway, that's really all I had. Good night. <laughs> you said you didn't have any words for so that's good. <laughs> There are no more speakers, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Um, agenda item number 16, uh, business from council members. And I'm going to start with Mr. Bennett because he tells me that he's owed how much time again? Well, let's see. How many meetings did I miss? <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I hope you guys are, are ready to be here till Wednesday. <laughs> um, but I should be quick. First off, thank you all. It's good to be back. I'm glad to be back. Um, in my absence, I watched every meeting from home. Um, if Heather was constantly looking at her phone, it was because I was constantly texting her to write something down. And um, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was a hard period of time, but I, I was constantly active in any way I could be uh, as, a, as a citizen um, during that time. But now we have a lot to do, and I have to hit the ground sprinting. Not, you know, can't even just jog um, to, to get a lot done in the next uh, week and then the weeks that follow. Um, real quick, I just want to talk about the Susquehanna Hose Company uh, installation and awards banquet. That was an incredible event. You know, speaking about safety, um, we were able to celebrate them. Um, Susquehanna Hose Company is the, the fire department that supports um, Havity Grace, and, uh, and they are rated as a class one fire department, uh, which is, they're the only volunteer fire department in the state of Maryland that's rated as class one, and they're a part of a group of less than 250 fire departments, volunteer or career fire departments um, in the United States, so they're part of a group of less than 1% that are, are rated that high. Uh, which is just amazing. And, you know, I know my wife and I personally feel lucky. Um, you know, we hear their alarm go off constantly because we live in the middle of downtown. But every time we hear that bell, we know we see their trucks go by instantly. It's, their response time is amazing. Uh, we learned that they have over 40 volunteers, on average, respond per call. Um, and many of their volunteers respond to 600 plus calls a year. Their commitment to our community is second to none. And like I told them, you know, uh, their commitment to us is only uh, a responsibility to us to be committed to them. And so anything that uh, we can do to support them or um, our, our 911 dispatchers, you know, the fact that it's even a debate over 75 cents, I just think is preposterous. It's 75 cents, and they make it so whether or not somebody gets help in time. It's 75 cents, you know, but um, it's, I don't even think that's a conversation at 75 cents. But anyway, it was a really great event. We got to celebrate Drew Triplett and Stephanie Deal, who were the firefighter of the year and volunteer of the year. Um, and it was just, it was really fun. Um, speaking of safety, you know, um, uh, I, I, I've seen the video and I want you to know that um, I've been in a lot of conversation in the past week with members of city council in Aberdeen. Um, I've been in conversation with members of the county council. I've been in conversations with the county executive. Um, it's really a tricky situation because it's in the city of Aberdeen, which just makes it uh, hard for us to navigate, but I'm, I'm looking at how to address that situation because even moving forward, if we never, if we never add another truck to Harford County, that road is unacceptable and it's an unsafe situation presently without anything else. So we have to solve that situation and we have to find a way to address it. And so that's what I'm working on. Um, Heather and I are working to find a way to contact. Um, you know, CNS wholesale grocers and set up a meeting with them to figure out what we can do as far as working with them to try and, uh, and figure out what's going on with their operations that cause trucks to constantly be on the side of the road outside of them. Um, uh, also just uh, working with Aberdeen to see what can we do to help them get some solutions into the works. Um, and so just looking for any angle that we can work on to, to get something going because, uh, you know, even beyond the moratorium, beyond whatever legislation comes next, we have to save 
that road, make it safe so that, you know, you can get to and from your house forever in a, a safe and orderly fashion. So that's something that I'm working on. Um, uh, and I want you to know that's a priority of mine that we're really looking at carefully. So I just want you to know that that's been something that we spent a lot of time on in the past week since I've been back in office. So anyway, that's everything for me today. Well, that was not near what you said you were going to do, <laughs> Mr. Riley. Yes, I'll be sure. My wife is back from Annapolis for 90 days, so uh, she, she wants uh, my presence for some reason. But I do have one comment. Jessica, thank you for your service on County Council. That's it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Janitor Dennett. Thank you, Council President. Um, I'd also like to thank Jessica for your service. And uh, Jacob used all my time, so I'm going to have a pass. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council. <laughs> Mr. Fenman. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have a few things to discuss. District B Council Office has received several uh, questions regarding the Bear Trail uh, and when it will reopen. That's along uh, Tollgate Road across from Emerton Elementary. The trail has been closed for nearly a year uh, because five of the 40 acres has been cut down. Uh, my office reached out to the property owner, which is the Maryland Center of Arts. Myself and legislative, uh, legislative aide Jessica Blake, excuse me, uh, met with the executive director, Do uh, Dr. Bob Willenbrick, on the property to learn about the progress. While it is private property, the Maryland Center of Arts in, uh, intends to preserve the majority of the trail to allow the community to utilize. The Maryland Center of Arts is in current in, uh, currently in the permit and approval process and hopes to resume clearing a portion of that lot for the arts venue as soon as possible. I thought what was unique about the property is it possesses a slave burial site on the property. The historical society and the archaeologists were able to identify the area because of the stones that were used to mark the graves, which were not natural to the area. Uh, the burial site is not, not the area that is intended to be cleared, and the center uh, hopes, uh, well, plans to preserve and protect the grounds to honor the memory of the enslaved people there. Uh, also, last week, when Major General Edmondson was given his annual report, I asked him about the update on Woodley Road, um, which uh, would reduce some of the traffic concerns that have been mentioned. The general mentioned that he was waiting for the county to finalize uh, some of those things. Um, I spoke with the director of public works, Joe uh, Cmac, who indicated the county should have everything over to the general Edmondson and the staff later this, this month, which is encouraging. I would also like to recognize uh, my legislative aide, Jessica Blake. Jessica was present. Um, here at the council under Joe Woods uh, in myself, uh, and now she has a great career opportunity. So I congratulate you and thank you for your service to the county and the council. Uh, she's been a, uh, a tremendous asset to District B and uh, during my uh, transition during the last five months, so thank you. Um, Jessica will be replaced by a new legislative aide, uh, Lauren McDougall. Uh, effective this Saturday, Lauren brings her extensive human relations ex experience, and I'm confident she will do a great job to represent District B as well. So, welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Jessica. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Penman. Mr. Guthrie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Also, Jessica, congratulations. Uh, I know you've got, you'll do as well there as, you, as you've done here. Um, on uh, April 5th, I had the uh, opportunity uh, to be invited to a ribbon cutting ceremony along with the uh, President uh, Pat Vicente and County Executive uh, um, Bob Cassidy, uh, a, a ribbon cutting of, the, of a brand new Defense Center for Public Health at APG Edgewood, uh, Edgewood Center. Um, <clears throat> we also got an opportunity before the ribbon cutting ceremony to spend about two hours walking through the entire, this huge building uh, and seeing all the facilities that are inside that building. Um, uh, you, you're well protected uh, in this center. Uh, you, you, if you have an opportunity, you can get to the center and, and uh, see if you can get a tour of that building. I highly recommend it. And there was one part of the building that got me. They, they actually have a whole section where they deal with uh, literally all kinds of bugs, uh, ticks, um, roaches, uh, you name it. And they, they have this whole facility, and they have them all in jars and everything, and they, and they really have special rooms, and, and they're, they're fenced off, and they're, they're gated off and everything, so nothing interferes with the other one. 
and you you would be absolutely surprised at uh, what they go through for that. So we thank them for their service. Uh, on April the 5th, also attended the uh, Susquehanna Hose uh, um, Awards Banquet at the uh, Level Fire Hall. And uh, of course, I love their mashed potatoes. I guess that's one reason why I go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a on a uh, on kind of a lesser note, um, uh, everybody knows we had a bad fire in Edgewood uh, on Brookside Drive, where uh, five houses uh, were destroyed. Um, and um, uh, I appreciate Pat Vicente uh, uh, calling me because I uh, usually I'm usually up about seven in the morning, take my dogs out, I come back in after for about after about 15 minutes and I go right into my office at the house and I start on my cell phone as well first thing I noticed is there's a call from Pat and he, he told me about the uh, the fire in, in Edgewood so uh, on Brookside Drive so I jumped right in my car and went right up there got up there probably around 7:30 or so and and uh, appreciate Bob Castley he was he was there and he had left just before I got there um, but it's really a, a sad case of affairs to look at that uh, th those houses now. If you go online, look at some pictures, you'll see them. They are gutted. They're gone. Um, and I just uh, just uh, to uh, I don't know how many people. Maybe some of you here have it. Uh, maybe you don't. But uh, there's a number of houses in Joppa Town have it, a number of Edgewood, and I don't know about the rest of the county because not, they're not my district. But they did build a lot of houses in. Uh, in, in Harford County that have aluminum wire. Now, I'm, I come from the electrical trade, uh, 50 years in the, in, in the IBW, so I know a little bit about this subject. I just want to talk about it for a second because I want you to pay attention and look to, to see if you have aluminum wire. And I don't know that aluminum wire caused this fire, but I'm just trying to, after talking to the fire chief and all in the back, uh, they, they think that the middle house, the fire started in this middle house, but on the second deck outside at five o'clock in the morning. I just can't imagine how at five o'clock in the morning a fire starts on a deck on the second level of a house um, uh, uh, just just out of nowhere. It's just hard to believe. The only thing that I could think of is about this aluminum wire problem because I had a um, house I had before this one in, in Joppa Town had aluminum wire and I got a fire. I had a fire happen from the aluminum wire. And what, what happens is that um, uh, aluminum and copper don't mix. Okay, so you got aluminum, you got a, a copper outlet, and we all do, they're all, they're all copper. And you take an aluminum wire and you wrap it around that uh, screw and you tighten it down, uh, that's where the screw stays. However, particularly if it's on an outside wall. When I say outside wall, I mean you're inside, but the wall is right on the outside. If you've got some real cold weather and then somebody's operating something like a dryer like my wife was and running it, and um, uh, what happens is when you, the cold air on outside, it shrinks the aluminum wire. I mean, it, it can be, you know, so small, you, you definitely can't see it. But the aluminum wire shrinks, but the copper doesn't. So there's an arc between the aluminum wire and the and the copper copper screw, and then that arc goes up, catches on the wallboard. You got a fire, okay? And I got one just like that in my house, uh, and um, uh, caught the wallboard, and, uh, caught burned the whole right side of the house. Well, we've had a number of houses in in uh, Joppa Town over the years and in Edgewood that uh, have have caught fire because of it. So. It's just a warning, um, take a look at that to see if you've got aluminum wire and also pay attention to those outlets, particularly outside. You're supposed to have a little button if you're familiar with an outlet and there's two little buttons right in between them. Uh, that's the trip just in case the, 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 the plug gets overloaded and don't get made at it because that's saving you a fire, saving you a problem. If it's tripping, you got a problem and you need to replace that outlet. So thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry I went on, but that concerns me when I was there 7 30 in the morning and <clears throat> by the way uh, let me say one more thing I, I really got to thank the fire department so we had three alarm fire and I went the, the social services I mean they were all there uh, early and I got there about 7 30 they were already there and they already had talked to them and I, and I talked to some of the people who lived there and uh, was able to help uh, along with the social services to get them into a hotel room um, 
uh, since they've lost their home and lost everything in it. So um, pray for them, and uh, we'll see, do the county will do what we can to take care of these people until they can get their house built. Thank you. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. Um, and thank you for uh, making that trip down there because uh, I knew as soon as I saw it, it was something that you wanted to know about and be there to help with. Um, and then to uh, add on to your comments about the public health laboratory, uh, it was an amazing facility. It has 67 individual lab spaces, 300 scientists, and their number one charge is to follow basically the warfighter wherever they go in the world uh, to cover any type of uh, environmental health, occupational health, toxicology, whatever they need uh, to keep them safe, uh, Aberdeen South at Edgewood is one of the few facilities in this country that have this capability. It's amazing. Um, so uh, I appreciate the tour. Uh, and then also uh, following up from Tuesday night's meeting, uh, Major General Edmondson was there and he pulled me off to the side. He said, I couldn't say last night when you asked me how much longer I was gonna be here, but he did confirm they extended his stay for another year. So uh, he will be here for a while. Um, our budget is due with us by the charter on the 15th. Uh, so I'm assuming that we'll get it Friday and the business. And along with that, uh, I need to remind each of you with our, our budget work sessions. And if I may this time, just to give the audience a chance to hear, uh, on Wednesday, April 19th, on the, we will be interviewing or listening to the county executive, uh, the spending affordability report, uh, the chief executive staff, director of administration, budget and management, our county council budget, Humane Society, Hartford Community College, Hartford Center, the ARC, and the elections board. On the 20th, we'll be listening to the office of the director for DPW, highways, DPW, environment services and sustainability, DPW, water and sewer, DPW, treasury, the law department, office of economic development, housing and community development, extension services, and soil conservation. On the 24th, Monday the 24th, uh, in these chambers as well, at 10 o'clock we'll start with the libraries, Board of Education, DILP, Community Services, Planning and Zoning, the State's Attorney's Office, and the Judicial System. On the 25th, at 9 o'clock in these chambers, we'll go with Parks and Recreation, Human Resources, procurement, health department, information and communications technology, sheriff's office, emergency service, and our volunteer fire companies. Um, just to give you an idea of what type of, of research that my colleagues and their citizen budget advisors are gonna be diving into in just a short amount of time. Um, unfortunately, we can't get it any sooner. We'd love to have as much time as possible to be able to review each department um, but we will continue to do the best that we can. And uh, finally, uh, Jessica, thank you for your service. Thank you for being there when I need you. Appreciate it. Uh, and with that, uh, this will adjourn the meeting, conclude the meeting.